I finished up uh, the mortar and now I'm working on the pestle and uh, it doesn't look like it yet but it, hopefully it's going to it's one heavy chunk of sugar maple here I mean, my entire life I've spent in trees and to say they they fascinate me would be an understatement we're still learning about trees uh, they're the largest living organism in the world they're the oldest living organism in the world and their uses and applications and their beauty is uh, well it's outstanding anyway this is a this is a, as I said sugar maple and this is what's called a gall and and uh, bowl makers will find these humongous galls on, on trees and, and they'll turn bowls out of them beautiful pieces of work uh, what causes that is an interesting thing because there's this uh, famous arborist, uh, Dr. Shigo, who, who finally demonstrated that trees aren't a healing organism. So if I cut myself shaving, uh, my body produces what's called scab cells. It heals, the scab goes away, in a week or two I don't know I've been wounded. We used to think trees healed because we'd see it close over a wound like that or there's an old branch union. And Essentially that's just callus growth, it's expansion of cells. But a single insect, a wood borer, can enter a tree and what happens is the tree, because it compartmentalizes it, it boxes off that insect. It doesn't want it to do more damage. So every year the tree puts on a growth ring and every year it comes to that little spot that it's built this compartmentalized box and it goes around it creating that bump. And a single tiny little wood borer can produce these growths on the side of trees that are huge. Uh, anyway, and I use them. Uh, this is a, a, a noggin or a drinking mug, very commonly carried in the 1700s on one sash. Um, in that time period, anybody could drink the water. So you could go to a stream, dip it out, have a drink, put it back in your sash and carry on with your walk or your hunt or whatever. Anyway, I'm going to try to whittle this guy down. I'm going to use that uh, gall area there because it's going to be really hard. Um, for my pounding surface uh, for the pestle and somehow I gotta whittle this down into a sort of a shaft size piece of wood so I'm gonna work at that and uh, then we're gonna parch some corn. So a friend of mine and neighbor Gary Frizzell he, he, he calls me up and he said I understand you're looking for a rock for the cap on your chimney. He says I got just the perfect one for you so we went over there and uh, we brought this back here with that intent but Thinking it weighs somewhere around 400 pounds, maybe a tad more, and there's no way I'm getting that up there. So, um, not going to waste gear. I'm going to move it over in front of my woodshed, put my splitting block on it, just like a good, well-placed anvil. It, it will uh, it won't let the uh, the splitting motion uh, be absorbed by the ground, so it's going to give me a good surface for that. So we are going to use it if I can somehow figure out how to get it over there about 20 yards. Anyway, uh, we're going to try to whittle some of this this guy out and see how this goes.
Okay, that's uh, rather crude looking, but it's going to work. It's going to work just just fine. Uh, I want to get parching corn because it's that time of year, but this winter I'm going to let that dry out a bit. Uh, and I'm going to finish that handle up nice and smooth, but it's going to work for my job today. So I'm going to get to parching some corn. If we uh, think about fast food in the 21st century, well, pemmican, as I mentioned earlier, was the fast food of the indigenous peoples, or the woodland indigenous peoples at least. Uh, it was easily transportable. It would last for over a year. Uh, it was a great source of protein, uh, and it basically had everything it needed in one little cake. Um, and back to that waste not one not, natives didn't waste anything with their, with their corn. They, um, they'd use the husks to make, uh, they'd actually make moccasins out of them. Uh, they'd make children's dolls, they'd make masks, they'd use it as kindling. They'd stuff uh, 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 mattress type situations where they'd use the corn husk to have a, a softer sleeping platform. Uh, they even used the husks for things, they'd soak them in fat and use them like a torch. Um, nothing went to waste. Anyway, we've got, uh, we've got a bunch of it peeled. Didn't have a lot of luck with my corn this year, so the raccoons got it at the start. Uh, I had trouble keeping them at bay. The, the way natives did it, often they would just sun dry it, so, um, and it would be the job of the children and the elderly women to monitor that corn, keep the coons away, uh, turning it. They laid out flat rocks and dry it in the, in the heat of fall. Uh, anyway, so we, we had issues with the coons, they got a lot of it. So I moved it inside and it was a little too damp where I had it stored, so I got a little bit of mold, but finally I got some batches that turned out. So I'm gonna parch them today. We're gonna to grind it in my new mortar and pestle, and uh, yeah, we'll have some cornmeal for the winter. So, this is called the parching method, and uh, basically we just want to dry it till that till the outer kernel splits a bit, and then we're going to be able to pulverize that down into a flour we can use for for numerous things. Um, and that's about the amount you want in the pan. You just want to cover the bottom and stir it frequently. It's just a dry pan. We're drying that out. Another method they used it was called hominy, and they would take the kernels of corn and they'd soak it in water, and uh, over time that would 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 crack the outer kernel as well. Um, it wouldn't be stored for the winter. It would have been used in soups and stews and such. So anyway, uh, a very old method of food preservation and one that certainly works. me of making my uh, my coffee so I start with the uh, green coffee beans which they would have had if, if they were fortunate enough to get it it was quite hard, hard to come by uh, and just dry uh, roast the beans in a dry frying pan until you get them as dark as you want them and pulverize them and not a whole lot different than making a little parched corn
there we have ground parched corn. Uh, it's interesting, uh, indigenous peoples, uh, if they had to travel far and they had to travel light, like perhaps a war party or what have you, they would take nothing but uh, a small satchel of, of, uh, of parched corn. Uh, almost the perfect energy food filled them up. Uh, and it wasn't just natives, Europeans adopted that as sort of the superfood of the 1700s, 1800s. So military groups that were on campaign, for example, um, perhaps uh, Grogan's volunteers of the, war, of the French and Indian War or Brant's volunteers of the Revolutionary War, uh, Rogers Rangers and such, they would carry this as well. And often they'd have what they called cold camps. And what that meant when your commander would say cold camp, that was the only command, and that meant no fires, no fires, no noise. So they would take that corn rare and they throw a mouthful of that, a handful of that in their mouth, I should say, followed by a swig out of their canteen, and that was supper. I suspect a few moans and groans went up from the troops when they were told they had to be quiet for the night. And they'd often use that on, on their approach if they were reconnoitering in a military situation or if they were planning a surprise attack on the morn. Um, that, that would be supper right there. Anyway, got a lot more to do. I see some corn cakes for breakfast tomorrow. So I'm uh, preparing a traditional Irish boiled meal tonight. I've got some company coming over to the little cabin and uh, probably playing a wee bit of cards after. Um, the one pot meal, if I think about it, my, my ancestors all come from Ireland. So they lived through five, five uh, potato famines um, over the course of very few years leading up to the uh, Black 47, which was the worst. Um, Anyway, one pot meals were the norm, and I think for a couple of reasons, uh, it may have been as simple as they only had one pot. These were quite impoverished people. Um, and the other reason, they would add a lot of water to it, um, hence the boiled meal part, because that would extract the nutrients from the ingredients and uh, fill more people up. And if there were leftovers, they'd just add more water to that pot, cook it up again. So yeah, we're cooking up a meal and the ingredients are pretty simple. We've got all the items here are from the garden except for this pork shoulder roast. We've got potatoes, onions, carrots, and cabbage. I've got a couple of teaspoons of apple cider vinegar, which they would have had. Um, and I might have a wee bit of ale as well. And we're gonna put this all together, get it cooking. Um, only takes about an hour and a half to cook and it's an absolutely delicious meal. <laughs> 